So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us for the second panel series this term. Um, and I'm really delighted and honoured to have our two spe speakers today, uh, Dr. Neil and Dr. Presby. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Moses couldn't join us today, but we hope to get him for a future event. Um, so I will just introduce myself. I'm Shashmita, a second year philosophy and theology student at St. Bennett's Hall, Oxford. And I'm representing QUIP. QUIP is People for Women in Philosophy which is a non-hierarchical group of individuals who provide an inclusive space for all those who study philosophy, as well as critically engage with broadening conceptions of philosophy. The group was created around three years ago and has been gaining momentum ever since. This group aims to address long-term systemic issues within philosophy at Oxford, and also strives to support students by holding events such as a philosophy essay writing workshop um, and mentorship schemes. We also interview academics from marginalised groups um, and as of recently we are doing this series. So before Emma introduces herself, I'm just going to hide the link in the chat, a quick blog and also a quick sign up sheet for anyone who would like to get involved with these kind of activities. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to double check. Um, my name's Emma. I am a second year philosophy, politics and economics student at St. Catherine's College, Oxford. Um, I'm here sort of co-hosting this on behalf of the Oxford PPE Society, uh, which is sort of dedicated to looking at the intersections between philosophy, politics and economics. Um, we host talks on topics as diverse as the AI revolution, the rise of far-right populism in Europe and the ethics of veganism. Um, some of our past speakers include Patricia Churchland, Stephen Lukes, uh, the feminist scholar Bonnie Honig. So we're very excited to be here today working with Quip and seeing what the speakers have to say. Um, Just to introduce this series before um, we introduce the speakers. So this series aims to address some publicly and commonly entertained contradictions in the, particularly, in the particular revolutionary topic of each panel. To unpack these contradictions, oversights and problems, and to challenge the irresponsibilities of uncritical thought by engaging us in critical inquiry. Our broader concerns covers the violence perpetuating uncritical thought and what it inflicts and how non-violence is spoken about and enacted surrounding revolutions and revolutionary thought. The broad topic of focus for today's panel is Black liberation. So just to introduce and give a little bit of background on our speakers, uh, we're joined by Dr. Gail Presby, who's currently Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Kearney Latin American Solidarity Archive at the University of Detroit Mercy. Uh, she has edited in, uh, Introductory Philosophy Text, The Philosophical Quest, um, and is first editor of Thought and Practice in African Philosophy and editor of Philosophical Perspectives on the War on Terrorism. Um, together with Dr. Moses, who sadly can, can't join us, she edited Peace, Philosophy and Public Life, Commitments, Crises and Concepts for Engaged Thinking, which argued that peace must be a public thing with philosophers of peace working publicly for public results. Um, it shows how public engagement was a significant feature of peace philosophers of the past, like Camus, Sartre, Dewey and Day and how we can transform contemporary practices for immigration, police detention, and mental health to sustain increasingly diverse democracies. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Anthony Sean Neal. Uh, Dr. Neal is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Mississippi State University. Uh, his first book, Common Ground, compared the ideas of consciousness in the writings of Howard Furman and Huey Newton to determine if there was any confluence. Uh, Furman's theology of radical nonviolence influenced and shaped a generation of civil rights activists. Um, and he was a key mentor to leaders within the civil rights movement, including Dr. King. Um, yeah. And his second book, 
is Howard Berman's philosophical mysticism, Love Against Fragmentation. Uh, this exposes the philosophical ideas of Howard Berman with special attention to their connection to the freedom struggle of African Americans in the modern era. It explores his deep rooted knowledge of black culture, particularly black religious ideas as they existed during the period of African enslavement in the United States and as they were exhibited in the Negro spirituals, how they shaped his thinking and allowed him to produce a body of work grounded in the musing and tradition of his ancestors. Um, I think he is also, uh, Dr. Neil is currently working on a book entitled The Modern Era of the African-American Freedom Struggle, if I'm correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, great, so I suppose without further ado, we'd like to sort of hand over to our speakers. Uh, yeah, so Dr. Presby, I suppose. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope I, my screen share will work. And thank you very much, Susmita and Emma and your organizations for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Um, let me get my PowerPoint started. So, uh, I heard that you were talking about uh, revolutions and had particular interest in nonviolent revolutions and black liberation and hearing the themes that your group was interested in. And by the way, I've watched a few of your panels up to now and I think it's great that you have this series. I thought that perhaps on these themes, I could share some of the research I did on the revolution in Ghana, Ghana's independence movement, which used nonviolent tactics and also espoused a nonviolent philosophy. And because the, the uh, um, word revolution, of course, it can have a broad meaning and a, a more narrower meaning. And I always remember Hannah Arendt said that the word revolution first meant going back, revolving, going back to the past, but we don't mean that anymore. The word revolution now means a substantial change in a broad sense, a substantial change that challenges our presuppositions. Uh, in a more narrow sense, a revolution can mean a change in government. And so I thought, why not just start with my example of a time when there was a nonviolent revolution? And of course, I'm not the first one to uh, discuss it because uh, CLR James wrote a whole book on Ghana's nonviolent revolution. Uh, so did George Padmore, Gold Coast Revolution. And of course, I'm going to draw on them. But I'm also going to share with you some uh, independent research I did myself. And in particular, I took a look at the newspapers that Kwame Nkrumah owned and ran at the time of his nonviolent movement to see what those newspapers were saying about this concept of nonviolence. So that's part of what I'm going to share with you today. And I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time because there's too much I would like to say. So as you can see from my first screen here, I've got uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and I may have a chance to talk about how in the midst of the struggle, he was compared to Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a little uh, um, postcard that was circulated. Uh, to uh, promote the idea that Nkrumah should be the leader of this revolution of Ghana, but also uh, Bill Sutherland and Franz Fanon. Uh, Bill Sutherland, African-American nonviolent advocate who came to Ghana and worked with Nkrumah and Bedema and advocated nonviolence, not only in the case of Ghana's independence, but also spearheaded a movement to protest the testing of nuclear weapons in West Africa by France. So there's an anti-nuclear aspect to the nonviolence movement in Ghana. 
And then there's also Fanon who came to Ghana and lived there as the ambassador to Algeria and also had his own influence suggesting that nonviolence should not be considered the only the only approach to be used in the African liberation movement. But first I want to go back with a little historical background before the time of independence. I mean, the Gold Coast was home, that's the name that the British gave it as their colony, but it had a long standing practice of various groups having their own self-government uh, much before the British came there. And of course the Dutch came there before the British, but the British finally consolidated their military power considering the Gold Coast their colony in 1874. And it's interesting to note that at this time when the Asante Hene of, of the leader of the Ashanti people had finally capitulated, it was in a context where the Gatling gun and other automatic machinery had recently been um, recently been uh, invented and had not yet really been used. But of course, there's more than one way to use a weapon. It can it can be used by you shoot it and people die, but it, it can also be used as a threat. And historians have said that the British used this automatic machinery as a threat against the Asante Hene and said, and even demonstrated its use to messengers of the Asante Hene and said, if you do not capitulate, this is what we will do to you. And this is part of how the British got control of the Gold Coast. Now, within uh, two decades, they're going to use it to slaughter Zulu people in the in southern Africa. So they aren't only going to use it as a threat, they're also going to use it and kill thousands of people with it. But at this point, this is part of the story of the reason why the British gain hold of Gold Coast. However, there were widespread protests even before 1874. There was widespread compliance with Sorry, there was widespread compliance, non-compliance with the 1852 poll tax. And there was the Fonte Confederation in 1869, which asserted their independence from the British. They adopted their own constitution. They collected their own poll tax. They created a government seal. They raised an army. So, so there was always an opposition to British rule. There was a tension there. And many of the early activities, for example, the Aborigines Rights Protection Society from 1897 uh, was protesting a British policy that said all waste and unoccupied lands should go to colonial authorities. They sent a delegation to London. They succeeded in having the bill withdrawn. They set up their own schools independent of the British system. This was important uh, in many uh, nonviolent campaigns against uh, British rule. They also had a lot of fraternal and mutual benefit associations. And uh, so there was a long history of nonviolent action. There were nonviolent resistances against the Waterworks Bill in 1934 against a sedition amendment known as Ordinance 21. So, uh, and there were two cocoa grower sellers boycotts. Now these are not consumer boycotts where you say you will not buy something for a political reason. These are uh, the growers and sellers who refused to sell because they realized the British were making a monopoly on where you could sell your cocoa and they were offering a very low price. So twice in 3031 and again in 37 to 38, uh, there were these 
organized and uh, hold up of sales of cocoa. So I say this because I don't want you to think that Kwame Nkrumah was the first person to bring the idea of concerted nonviolent action to Ghana. It was there for quite a while. Now, there was a Pan-African movement and looking at what Du Bois wrote about it, he talks about it as started in 1900 by a black West Indian barrister, H. Sylvester Williams of Trinidad. And it is important to notice the, the Trinidadians who are part of this Pan-African movement, Trinidad, uh, being also uh, colonized by the British, also having a large Indian population being part of the British Empire. It is close to the coast of the northern coast of South America. These international movements of the Pan-African movement were, were uh, attempts to get the African diaspora together to fight European colonialism in the African continent. And Du Bois was very central to these Pan-African movements. And he emphasized Africa-India unity as early as 1907. He talked about the Asian uprising as a role model for other rebellions, including Africa. So he was looking around the world for these models. Uh, here's just another example. Uh, he specifically had some interest in Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi ranked among one of the great men of the world. Uh, We'll see this, for better or worse, we'll see these uh, connections. Gandhi is in touch with the divine, devoted to bringing relief to the suffering. We'll see these same kind of metaphors being applied to Nkrumah when he uses nonviolence in Ghana. But after lauding his character, Du Bois turns to Gandhi's shrewd political tactics that use the moral high ground to achieve concrete political gains. So there's this emphasis on Gandhi as a religious figure, but also as a tactician. And if you read the works of Padmore and CLR James, you will see they focus on the same thing. James, who writes about Gandhi in Trinidad in 1909 before he ever comes to England, nevertheless is always looking to Gandhi for shrewd tactics. Um, okay, so I've already told you about Padmore. I'm keeping in mind the time. Kwame Nkrumah was somebody who He's from Ghana. He studied in the United States. From the very beginning, he was winning the presidential election of the African Students Association. So he started his activism as, as a student in the US and he was on many debate panels. So really uh, what uh, you students are, are doing here online debating these issues of nonviolence. Well, that's what uh, Nkrumah did during his years as a student. He even had a student newspaper, uh, the African Interpreter, where he, um, one of the first things in the very first issue mentioned was asking for the release of Mohandas Gandhi, who was in jail for a nonviolent protest at the time. Now, I skipped over several uh, Pan-African Congresses, but the one that happened in 1945 in Manchester, England is so interesting. It's, I mean, much has been written about it and there's enough to give a whole presentation just on this. But anyway, what had happened is Padmore was organizing it. He was already based in England at the time. And CLR James, who had been in England, but then had gone to the US, met Nkrumah in the US and basically sent Nkrumah 
to England to work with Padmore on this Pan-African Congress. And one of the things that was emphasized at this was to have a plan of action for Africa based on the Gandhi's technique of nonviolent non-cooperation, in other words, the withholding of labor, civil disobedience, and economic boycott. So Nkrumah was involved in the conference. These issues were debated at length, pro and con at the Congress. There was a manifesto advocating use of these methods at the Congress. And right after the Congress, Kwame Nkrumah returned to Ghana, uh, Gold Coast at the time, with the hopes of having this nonviolent revolution. So, uh, so this is Ghana, and this is where Nkrumah returned. And it changed its name to Ghana, no longer as Gold Coast. It's not exactly the same boundaries as the historical kingdom of Ghana, but uh, Nkrumah didn't want the name to have these, the Gold Coast is such a colonial name where, where Europe goes to get its gold. So he wanted a new name, although there is of course a dispute. Danqua says, no, he thought of the name, but you can at least find that Nkrumah declares that now Gold Coast should be called Ghana. And he declares the independence before he gets it, which is, of course, one of the traditions. The American Revolution Declaration of Independence is before they fight to get independence. It's the day of declaration. And uh, even Gandhi in India does that, declares Indians independence before the, the British uh, concede independence. So this is part of what Nkrumah is doing it. He doesn't do it till December 1948 in his newspaper. Now I'm going to backtrack earlier in this same year to tell you the story of some of what was going on in Ghana and how Nkrumah got involved. So how did he start the Accra Evening News? Uh, he launched it September 3rd, 1948, the day he was fired as general secretary of another competing organization, the UGCC, headed by Danka. He thought they were not, uh, they were, they were not going to get independence soon enough. So he wanted to be independent of them. He started his newspaper and Kamla Bedema was the editor of the paper and the general organizer of their new organization, Congress People's Party. And when Nkrumah was thrown in jail, it's Bedema who headed the movement to get Nkrumah out of jail. This is what he said in day one, the first volume one, number one of his independent newspaper, which he was using then to uh, spread the word of his movement. Ethiopia stretches forth her yearning hands. Africa moves on towards her emancipation. The Gold Coast advances into the arena of world politics and recognition. So right from the start, Nkrumah is thinking of the liberation of Gold Coast into Ghana as the first step of a continent-wide nonviolent revolution against the colonial powers of Europe. And uh, his own newspaper covered his um, speeches. This one calls his lecture the greatest of all his lectures. So there is uh, some of that coming across in Kerma's newspaper. It's important to know about this group that's known as the ex-servicemen. These are uh, Gold Coast uh, volunteers for the British Army during the Second World War. And they volunteered, they fought uh, readily, they were uh, taken uh, to South Africa and India for training. They were deployed in Burma. And while they were abroad, because they were stationed in Natal, and Gandhi had a long history in Natal, South Africa, and some of them were even uh, stationed in Bombay in India, and in their own mimeographed uh, 
weekly, they talked about, um, Adrian Israel talks about this in her articles and dissertation. These ex-servicemen talked about learning about Gandhi as a person and the independence movement in India and their nonviolent tactics. So these ex-servicemen learned about that. And then uh, there they were back in Gold Coast having no independence from the British and not getting their pensions. And they were putting two and two together and thinking it was a time to act nonviolently. Now you can hear uh, some of these interviews with uh, some of these ex-servicemen if you go to the PBS series. Um, and here's uh, Jeffrey Aruma who's talking about it. I also had a chance to interview Joseph Yadua who was an ex-serviceman and he always talked about, uh, we seek advice from Krumen. he will always tell us to not be in favor of violence. And he was uh, stationed, this was his uh, regiment in Burma. Now, I'm not saying there was absolutely no violence in Ghana's nonviolent movement, but Nkrumah did, sorry, every so often my slides are going forward. <laughs> um, they did listen to um, Nkrumah in general. So there was this group, they, I am not saying they got their orders from Nkrumah on their own. A group of ex-servicemen decided to uh, march to the, the castle of the, uh, the viceroy the, the, and tell, tell the powers that be that they wanted uh, to be respected, they wanted better pay, and they had a series of their own issues and they were taking a petition and they were unarmed when British troops fired on them and killed several of them. Now, this led to a, a large movement, some of which was violent on that day as a response when people were in mourning. And Nkrumah took the opportunity to comment on that movement. So basically, Nkrumah wanted to warn the British, if you don't give us our um, independence, these are going to be the problems you will have. But he was not advocating a violent uprising. Nevertheless, he was put in jail with, uh, they tried to say he was in charge of this uprising that happened. There was a Watson commission that uh, looked into it and that commission said, there should be a new constitution for Ghana that allows internal self-government. Now, I want to take a look at this time period about what the newspapers owned by um, Nkrumah were saying about this tactic of nonviolent resistance to colonialism. And I was able to get uh, this uh, from the uh, Stanford University Library. They were one of the few places that had the Accra Evening News from this time period in their library collection. In fact, when I went to the National Archive in Ghana, they did not have it at the time I was there. I don't know if they've gotten it since then, but luckily Stanford had it. So for example, we see this example of Western civilization. What is it about? It's cutthroat competition and brute force. And the great powers of this civilization evidently exalt their vain and wicked belief that might is right, which is indeed a very dangerous maxim. So they're saying 
what do the British stand for? They stand for might is right. Now, as we know, you know, from the time that Thrasymachus argued this in ancient Greece, there have been philosophers who oppose this idea, but they are saying this is the philosophy of the British. We are not going to hold that philosophy. Oh, here's some other examples. This is one of the first notes, notices I notice of this use of the word positive action. So you may know that Gandhi started his, uh, coined his own term, uh, Satyagraha, and, uh, but Nkrumah wanted to coin a term that he thought would be good for his context. He didn't want to call it passive resistance. Gandhi didn't want to call it that either. Instead, he wanted to call it um, positive action. And so we see it being used here. It says here, um, Imperialism must be liquidated so men everywhere can live together, not as masters and servants, but in harmony, friendship, and equality. Well, how will it be liquidated? Now, here we say, uh, we hear and, uh, someone saying, we have learned by experience the only language the imperialists understand is that of brute force. But since we are not brutes, nor have the force, we intend to prevail on them with reason, sagacity, and tact. Here's another example. Tell Britain, we as youth have tasted the sweetness of gun bullets. We entertain no fear. We are now on brainy warfare. We believe in the maxim of the pen is mightier than the sword. Tell Britain that threats with imported soldiers, arming of Europeans, assassinations, imprisonments, deportations, and all imperialist movements cannot foil our onward march to our political emancipation. I'm going to skip over a few of these because I realize I must uh, sum up. Uh, Krumah made a pamphlet, what I mean by positive action, and people who've studied the pamphlet say he's taken a lot of these nonviolent methods from C.V.H. Rao's 1945 book, Civil Disobedience Movements in India. So he renames it, takes some of the same ideas, and Krumah later explained, we had no guns, but even if we had, the circumstances were such that nonviolent alternatives were open to us. It was necessary to try them before resorting to other means. Now, he called for a general strike, and there was a huge general strike, and people did maintain nonviolent discipline. Um, all right, I'm going to go now to the fact that Nkrumah was jailed while he was imprisoned. Betama, as I told you, uh, had helped uh, to try to get him out of prison. He was voted as leader of government business while he was in prison. He was let out, became head of government business and then prime minister in 1952. You may know Ghana got its independence in 1957. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. came. Here's going to be my uh, segue to our next talk. Uh, coming back to African Americans and the movement, the civil rights movement, the liberation movement in the United States. Uh, Bill Sutherland, who I mentioned before, was instrumental in making sure that Martin Luther King Jr. could be in Ghana at the time that it received its independence. And King uh, delivered a sermon at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where he talked about why he thought Ghana was such an important example. And here's a few quotes. He says, there is something in the soul that cries out for freedom there is something deep down within the very soul of man that reaches out for Canaan. Men cannot be satisfied with Egypt. 
That night we walked into the closing of Parliament. Nkrumah stood up and made his clothing, closing speech to Parliament with the little cap he wore in prison for several months and the coat he wore in prison for several months and all his ministers round about him, by the way, that was done in the movement in India a lot. And he says, it reminds us of the fact that a nation or a people can break a loose from oppression without violence. Now, I feel like I've only just uh, told you the basic backbone of the story. And there is so much more to say, but I don't want to talk much longer at this point. I will, of course, answer any questions and at a, after a certain point, we can come back uh, again for more Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Presby. That was very insightful. And I think it's particularly useful, um, not just kind of conceptualizing on the idea of revolutions separately from actually looking at the case studies. And so um, I'm really, I really enjoyed that. And so I'm just wondering if anyone does have any questions, um, you can either unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat and Emma and I can read it out. Um, and if there are no questions at the moment, we, we can move on. Um, but if you have questions throughout, we can, we can come back to them at the end. But I'll just, just wait a minute in case anyone does. I might have a question, if I may. I was wondering, I, I find like the internationalism of it just so fascinating. And it not only seems to be connected in the nonviolence in case of speeches sort of enc encouraging others, but also the idea of it kind of rejecting a kind of very kind of Western status system where they were attempting to sort of siphon off communities and actually isolate people in order for a sort of divide and rule. And I was wondering if you know you agreed with that or you had any thoughts on that kind of IR perspective. Um, well, so definitely. So uh, we have uh, Padmore and James al already coming with this internationalist uh, idea and, and, and Du Bois and this idea of pooling together all persons of the African diaspora, pool together their resources to help Africa as a continent. And then the strategic, where do we have a chance to do it? Where do we have our foothold? And uh, sending one of their protégés there. Right, because, and you have to realize that both James and Padmore come with a Marxist background, with in one case Communist Party, but then disillusioned by the Communist Party, another uh, Trotskyist, uh, uh, background. So they're thinking about international revolution. Uh, and then you have also just the fact that that the European powers carved up Africa and each was so intent on holding on to the part of Africa they carved for their own self-benefit and holding on to that with weapons. And if you take a look at Du Bois's history of Africa called the world in Africa. He says, what was the cause of the first world war? It was the scramble for, for Africa, European powers fighting with each other to keep a hold of their lucrative uh, colonies in Africa. And so, you know, the whole capitalist system, the whole colonialist system is implicated but how do you take on this worldwide empire? You get a foothold and that's how they started it with uh, Ghana. Um, and then of course, uh, Nkrumah faced internal opposition because he wanted to keep prioritizing the uh, international issues and others wanted him to focus on his own country. So uh, straight away, this issue about the nuclear, the use, the French uh, uh, 
using Africa as a place to test their nuclear weapons, that's also an international issue. And it's international because the fallout of the radiation is going to go across the international borders in Africa. And there needs again to be an international movement to exert pressure on France to stop the bombing in, in the Sahel. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of good reasons for it to be international. There's also, it's also understandable why it was hard to keep it going at that international level. I mean, it gets bogged down in a lot of deep, deep details and difficulties, but it was uh, definitely a good vision. Thank you so much. Um, would Dr. Neil like to take over now for his speech? And if you have any questions, please just put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Okay. Uh, thank you, and, um, and thank you for that wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Presby, and, and also thank you for uh, PWIP and also the PPE for inviting me to do this uh, presentation. I will say uh, one thing to Dr. Presby's presentation. I spent several summers in graduate school um, going over to Ghana, and uh, one of the worst arguments I ever heard was in the middle of the night on an airplane over the, uh, um, the Atlantic, um, whether who was who was better for Ghana, Rawlings or or, or Nkrumah, right? And and the argument, and if you've ever heard Ghanaians argue on this subject, it, it, it got really loud, but this is in the middle of the night. And and very interesting conversation. They ended up Rawlings was better for Ghana, Nkrumah was better for Africa. So I, I just thought I'd share that. But anyway, so uh, as I've said earlier, this is a portion of a book that I'm working on. Uh, the book is entitled The Modern Era of the African-American Freedom Struggle, and this section is entitled Mapping the Movement. I don't mean in, in terms of a regular map, but you shall see more about that as I go through it. So I'll just start. Often when the idea of movement gets invoked, strict attention is not given to the possibility that different understandings might exist of this term. In the absence of giving the contours of movement strict attention, there is the possibility of a failure to capture certain nuances, which leads to the reduced probability that the full intent of the word comes to the fore. On one extreme, there's the notion of movement, meaning motion or the change of spatial relationships between two or more bodies. But on another extreme, there is the notion of movement, meaning the exchange of ideas or changing consciousness conceptual frameworks or worldviews. Somewhere in between, there's the migration of feelings, emotions, the, the phenomenon of being in the world, or what some have labeled as a type of exchange of the self during moments of becoming. The modern era of the African-American freedom struggle was certainly a movement of the people, which many are in agreement concerning its existence. However, the acknowledgement that must be bound to any notion of black people in relationship to their status as human beings during this moment. Some past depictions of the movement were put forward as descriptions that are totally in response to the oppressive behavior of whites. In this sense, black people who participated in the freedom movement are not thought to have developed notions of community or even freedom, which should be given any attention by today's scholars because they are believed to lack complexity and to have purported only opposition. It is at this point I will put forth a, a novel understanding of freedom, one which I believe to be more useful in forming a conceptual frame from which to corral these discussions about freedom, and one which is drawn from the many readings of African American thinkers that I have read. With this conceptual framework, it will be possible to gain still greater clarity about the dissonant features of the movement of Blacks toward freedom and the usefulness of this analog for making these features visible. Freedom is movement. 
Freedom and struggle are not equivalent. Freedom is simply movement and wherever there is freedom of some kind, there is movement of some kind. When greater restrictions are placed upon movement of any kind, freedom is restricted to the same degree. When freedom is denied, movement is denied. The movement among black people was about freedom and was the exercise of freedom. All attempts to curtail the movement were attempts to limit freedom. Therefore, to be a reactionary towards the attempts by others to gain their freedom is to be against movement, which is freedom. Conservative strategies to keep things as they are limit freedom or stand against movement. Freedom is movement. Mapping the movement, which this talk is labeled, points to an attempt to acknowledge the correlation between the concept of movement and the temporal spatial reality of movement. Just as maps are used to determine location and spatial relationships at a given point in time, the idea of mapping the movement is meant to perform a similar function in terms of the movement. Also, just as maps use reference points to make determinations concerning these temporal spatial relationships, the predominating ideas mentioned earlier of the movement, which are peace, rebellion, revolution, and freedom will also perform a similar function such that the movement can be better charted during the modern era. In order to find a location on a map, there are certain tools of which one must be familiar. Of these tools, two seem to be the most important. They are coordinates and scales. For the purpose of locating an individual in terms of the geography, I will use the following categories as coordinating tools speeches, talks, actions, activities, and writings. And for the purpose of scalar quantities in terms of the coordinating categories, this analysis will use the individual's commitment to the concept in place of numerical value to measure their temporal spatial relationship to the notion of freedom. The individual's commitment to freedom might well be verbalized and written about, but they may also subscribe to the notion of peace at all costs. Their subscription to peace will put them in a position of sacrificing freedom for the sake of And their commitment to freedom produces a low position in terms of their movement participation. No number is needed to represent this contradiction in their commitment. The uses of peace, rebellion, revolution, and freedom as it applies in this writing is put forward here and earlier for the purpose of establishing conceptual categories and frameworks to which black thought about the black experience might be analyzed. In this sense, black thought about the black experience or black people thinking about the existential nature of blackness is essentially philosophizing. In the performance of this reflective activity, certain common concepts have become standard notions or concepts of the comportment of black consciousness in the face of the existential condition of blackness. Four of these concepts being peace, rebellion, revolution, and freedom are presented here not to encapsulate all categories of black thought, but to demonstrate African-American philosophy as a distinct mode of thinking and subject of which to study. This is what I take to be, this is what I take as the point of which was presented by Lucius Outlaw in his proclamation of African-American philosophy as being necessarily pragmatic in character while focusing on the existential conditions of black people. To be sure, this type of thought or philosophizing can be separated into two modes or forms, one formal and the other informal. The purpose here is not to determine which is the more valid mode, but to demonstrate that black people have systematically thought about the black experience and have gone, have even gone further to also think about how one should think about the black experience. Certainly, I do not mean to propose that eventually writings or texts will be found on plantation archeological digs containing, containing the philosophical musings of the formerly enslaved Africans. I simply mean that the activity known as philosophizing was not foreign to black people, but it was not until the modern era that opportunities to put these thoughts on paper presented themselves in any significant measure. Peace, rebellion, revolution, and freedom serve as guideposts such that upon mapping the movement, 
The contours of such philosophizing might easily become, in the words of Charles Mills, blackness visible. An early example approaching what is meant by the notion currently being put forward is demonstrated in the writings of Frederick Douglass. In his oration delivered at Corinthian Hall, Rochester, New York, July 5th, 1852, Douglass asked, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? The implication of the question assumes that at least some of the currently enslaved possessed at the time of the speech, the ability to think about the meaning of this particular holiday for themselves. This essentially means that they thought about what thoughts they had on the matter. In other words, they thought of themselves thinking about this American special day, or it can be said that they philosophized. Evidence of this phenomenon is demonstrated by Douglas, who himself was a former slave. As Douglas resolved to throw light on the matter through the writing of this speech, methodologically, it was not necessary for him to appeal to the phenomenological renderings of qualitative research provided by way of interviews with other former slaves. He knew firsthand how an enslaved person might feel for he had once suffered the very fate, except now he could place his thoughts into words on paper. He was able to reflect on his own past thoughts on the matter. He was also able to make determinations about their meaning. In doing so, extrapolations as to what his thoughts implied could be made. Douglas states, to him, that is to an African, to American slave, your celebration is a sham. This statement was made immediately after asking what these celebrations meant to the American slave. This description is a demonstration that in reflecting upon his thoughts as a slave, Frederick Douglass reflected upon the occurrence of these celebrations, observed their contradictions, and was able to make a determination about the meaning and value of the same. Also in this thought process or the philosophizing of Douglass, the recognition that the reflective act was catalytic in changing the slave in terms of how he came to understand the concept of American freedom and his own feelings on the matter was evident. Certainly Frederick Douglass would count as a participant in the freedom movement, although outside of or before the modern era, meaning he was conceptually, conceptually outside of the bounds of the modern era and existed before the time frame and existential conditions which brought about the modern era. He was bound by custom which addressed his blackness, but he never, he was never bound by the adjudication of Plessy versus Ferguson. There was no national legal standard which separated his skin from others. But what is Douglas's relationship to the freedom movement? In other words, how can it be demonstrated through points of reference that Douglas, Elaine Locke, and even Howard Thurman were in the same social movement without singularly referencing the obvious commonality of race, which, is, which in this sense becomes a weak reference tool. Narrowly speaking, a movement or the participants in a movement and therefore the non-participants as well can be classified in relationship to the movement by their psychology or conscious thought concerning the movement, their activity, that is, for example, grassroots organizing, with respect to the movement or their humanistic expression cre created in support of the movement or spawned by the agenda of the movement. However, before the mapping function is possible, the predominating ideas of peace, rebellion, revolution, and freedom must be defined. The defining of these terms is necessary because of the recognition that their regular usage is fraught with ambiguity and inaccuracy leading to relativistic and situational understanding. I will begin with peace and build towards the, a, a, consist, a consistent conceptual framework in which to situate the other terms. Peace assumes the reasonable attainment of an acknowledged common good. Common good can be understand in, understood in this sense as established flourishing, as an established flourishing environment for the greater community. However, just as, just as there is a concept of peace that is um, a 
just as there is a positive concept of peace, there is also a negative or false notion of peace, which is understood to be only the absence of verbal or physical conflict. That is peace, um, having uh, absent of conflict is some understand that as peace. An understanding of this negative notion of peace is required in order to deconstruct or rupture and often use but terribly inadequate notion of the term. The inadequacy in this notion of peace stems from an assumption that certain thing, things are held in common, such as common effort towards the goal of peace, along with common or shared notions about what counts as the flourishing life, experience. Peace as an ideal obtains relevance within social context owing to its connection to the concept of the good or a flourishing life. A life that flourishes in this context has no essential meaning, but must be kept in tension with concepts as expansion, such as expansion, progress, growth, and fulfillment. These concepts are usually thought to be opposite to a fragile existence or a life full of disappointment. Whereas peace should be understood to be necessarily communal or connection issue is anyone else uh, did i lose connection yes you were just speaking about how peace is sort of communal oh okay let me go back sorry about that i apologize all right um i don't know where i stopped but here we, here goes um the inadequacy of this notion of peace stems from an assumption that certain things are held in common, such as a common effort towards the goal of peace, along with common or shared notions about what counts as the flourishing experience. Peace as an ideal obtains relevance within social context, owing to its connection to the concept of the good or a flourishing life. A life that flourishes in this context has no essential meaning, but must be kept in, kept in tension with concepts such as expansion, progress, growth, and fulfillment. These concepts are usually thought to be opposite to a fragile existence or a life full of disappointment. Whereas peace should be understood to be necessarily communal or an agreement between two or more, rebellion requires no such agreement. Rebellion as such occurs when the authority or majority no longer provides for the common good or no longer establishes a flourishing environment. Rebellion in this sense should be understood as an overt act of rejection by an individual or a group of the predominant ideals or power structure which hinder the opportunities for flourishing by a group within the larger commun community or by an individual. Rebellion is demonstrated by simply saying no, or it can, be, it can also be a, a complex plan maneuver to demonstrate disagreement. However, rebellion begins by freely thinking, particularly thinking which is in opposition to the authority or larger communal structure. Thus, rebellion is a process which begins in meaningful silence. Rebellion is also the first step in a social movement. By comparison, peace stops social movement or thwarts its beginning. Rebellion requires social consciousness or some thought about the self in relationship to the power structure or larger group. It is plausible that peace does not carry the same requirement because thought about peace is less concerned with difference and more concerned with commonality. The more a person is committed to peace, their commitment to rebellion rises to the opposite degree. Therefore, even nonviolent struggle cannot be fully equated to peace because of its requirement to struggle. This is because struggle requires resistance in some fashion. Nonviolent struggle is also a type of rebellion. Peaceful resistance or peaceful struggle are both corrupt, corrupted concepts or misleading propaganda with no clear and concise meaning. Resistance and struggle are both rebellious actions 
and both are meant to disrupt peaceful states of existence. Therefore, rebellion tugs at the very fiber of peace. The, re the references made to a peaceful rebellion must therefore be taken as referencing the tactics of the rebellion and not to the maintenance of the status quo. Revolution is often confused with rebellion, but unlike rebellion, revolution requires a shared decision to make change, after which action is taken. Revolution rises above mere resistance or the mere resistive act and is ind indicative of communal thinking and communal effort to bring about societal change in consciousness coupled with sub substantive, substantive structural changes. Revolutionaries do not seek only to resist the status quo. Revolutionaries desire to change the status quo. Also, because revolution requires that the revolutionary go beyond mere rebellion by developing a change of consciousness or philosophical thinking and deep structural changes, it is therefore a higher or more intense form of rebellion. The revolutionary is compelled to not only consciously dissent, reject, or refuse, but the revolutionary must consider what the new beginning or way forward entails. This is the philosophical component. They must consider what constitutes the change they see, they seek, and what is only a reform of the status quo. The creation form or the substance of the revolution in some fundamental way must be incongruent with the previous instantiation of that society. If this is not true, can we really think that a revolution has occurred? The answer to the question has much to do with the true form of peace mentioned earlier. First, it was established that peace assumes the reasonable attainment of an acknowledged common good. Next, peace was established to be necessarily communal or an agreement between two or more. Revolutionaries engaged in the revolutionary act because they cannot flourish, engage in the revolutionary act because they cannot flourish or positively develop, which stifles their humanity. The right to development is a fundamental right that lies at the intersection of the entire gamut of economic, social, cultural, political, and civil rights. To develop is basic to all biological life, but for humans development at least on some level requires agency and agency requires freedom. Accordingly, revolution is thus the assertion of agency where freedom has been denied. Therefore peace, therefore the peace that the revolutionary desires is commensurate with freedom. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, sorry, it's just me to an eye slightly over tune. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, yeah, it kind of brought to mind um, sort of the idea of freedom as constantly moving and as not as a static thing. I think you can kind of see in, for example, like the sort of paradox of politics, which Honig mentions, which is sort of that there is no one single moment of justification or legitimacy and so on. Rather, it's a continual process which can be established through movements, I suppose, but also, you know, the establishing of public things and so on. So I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit more that, about that sort of continuity um, throughout time within, yeah. So, so I would say typically I tend to be a, a systematic thinker, right? And um, I guess in, in some ways in the continental tradition, right? And trying to get at this one concept that kind of flows through all of these kinds of ideas. And to me, it would be um, um, contradictory to say that uh, peace could be static, even if we're talking ideological or whatever, so, because all things move, right? So we have to allow for change, and you can't have uh, you can't have this idea of of, of freedom a, a, if you don't have the concept of movement. So, and in that sense, you're talking about some type of flourishing flourishing environment, which allows for people to develop, right? 
the idea of the slave was that the slave was going to be the exact same. He was not going to get the, idea, the, the ability to develop. Uh, in fact, that was the opposite of what it meant to be a slave. He's going to be static. He wasn't going to get a chance to grow in knowledge. <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't going to get a chance to uh, grow in terms of economic uh, situation, any of these kinds of things, right? So in that sense, the slave, we can go back to uh, the, the book that talks about slavery being, I think by Orlando Patterson, slavery being a type of social death. It does become a type of death outside of the human family. And even when you got to uh, segregation, right? It's, it's, it's a very similar concept, right? It, it, was, it was just a change in name. And, 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 and in some ways, um, it, it, I think it's Aaron Jada, Jada talks about this when they talk about the caste system, right? This, this idea of, of, of stagnation, right? No ability to flourish. And, and I wanted to keep that in, in um, intention with how we understand and how we experience life, right? So we, the way in which we really experience life is this idea of development, flourishing, things of that nature, or at least the possibility of flourishing. Um, no, I think that's fascinating. And it's also sort of interesting that both uh, talks kind of do emphasize the role of kind of intersubjectivity within movements and the importance of it being a dialogue and not viewing things on a kind of atomistic scale. Um, as sort of it, ideas of singular individuals or ideas which are somewhat determined or contained within. So, I, yeah, I think that's interesting and sort of plays into kind of Arendtian notions of power, you know, um, and how power develops through that into subjectivity, which needs to be constantly maintained. Is yeah, really fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Nina. Um, I I'm just going to open the floor up to any questions for the last 15 minutes and that's questions from students, questions between the speakers. Um, so you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so for um, the last week, I think your name was Dr. Which aspect of movement um, do you find most vital to radical progression? It's actually like, I've been thinking about this today. Um, you mentioned the different types of movement. So um, physical movement or like ideological, um, and which one do you think is most vital to like radical progression? I think it, um, they go hand in hand, but I would say they start in um, consciousness, right? So it's this idea, you know, um, I, I was working on a, a talk not long ago, I, and I said that in order to truly be free, you have to be able to have uh, to be able to say yes, no, and have a meaningful silence, mm -hmm. right? So, so that even in your silence, uh, you, when you're um, when you're oppressed, uh, your silence is 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 top down, right? What you're supposed to think about is given to you right? in a true oppressive situation, right? So, I, I think in some ways, um, consciousness has to go hand in hand with. Um, or the, otherwise, we get this lower state of, of revolution. We get uh, rebellion, I, um, and you know we can look at that in a in a um, d human development type of sense. Children can rebel, right? Small mm -hmm. children can rebel, but I don't know that small children can engage in in revolution in the sense that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Dr. Neil, if you don't mind. No problem. This may be a so, tough one. <laughs> I, well, I want to ask you, I, I, I was taking notes, and at one point in your talk, you said, nonviolent struggle can't be fully equated to peace. Nonviolent struggle is a type of rebellion, but rebellion tugs at the fiber of peace. So I wondered, because and then after rebellion, you talk about revolution. So I wondered if you could talk about nonviolent revolution, because I have some interest in that. And um, it's true that if you don't have a rebellion, the status quo violence continues. So you can't say that's nonviolent. But what do you think about a movement that specifically wants to be a rebellion and even a revolution because they may have a vision of what they want to do if they gain power, but they choose nonviolent means. Mm 
how does that fit in with your categories? Certainly. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things we can think about, I had a professor when I was uh, working on my master's and he said that uh, when he was growing up, um, um, and, and, and I'll just say that he's a white gentleman, American white gentleman, and, and so it's necessary for the story. He says when he was growing up, he was in a small town called Cuba, Alabama. Right. And he said in that small town, whenever he saw Martin Luther King Jr. on TV, he thought of Martin Luther King Jr. as one of the most terrible men. And he was starting all of these uh, situations of violence. Now, he's a young, young boy, but wherever he showed up, wherever Martin Luther King showed up, there was violence to break out and all these different things. So it was Martin Luther King's fault. Right. And he says, of course, now, now, you know, he's, he's, he's definitely changed. He's the other way on the other side of it. But what I'm getting at by this uh, idea that, um, that when you have some type of rebellion, rebellious act, right. The, it's a violation of space, right? Uh, Lewis Gordon talks about this, right? So just being there and saying, no, we're not gonna grow cocoa, right? That becomes a violation of space. You don't have the right to do that, right? You violated the, 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 the status quo. And so in that sense, it becomes violent. Right, it's a it's a it's a violation in that sense. I and 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 in that sense, it become it thwarts uh, the peaceful the peaceful whatever because in the the way in which and, and I take this from the conflict that you get with with um, between Du Bois and Washington, right, Booker T. Washington, and Washington wants peace, right? He's an accommodationist. Whatever you good white people want black people to do, we're willing to do those things. Right, and and Du Bois is like no, no, right, because that's going to give us more of the same. And there's a whole lot of other contextual reasons for that. But but but, but the 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 the, um, the major point is this: is that Washington wants peace at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and and Du Bois is clearly on the other side, right? And so what I'm doing is trying to make some distinction between those who are accommodationists. And, and even to some point, assimilationists, right? Uh, Thurman talks about when faced with an impressive force, um, the only thing we can do is either uh, rebel or imitate, right? And so it's that choice between rebelling and imitating, right? And, in, and once you decide to rebel, I think that that in some ways uh, moves against that low lying uh, peaceful state. No, that's a great answer. But if I can follow up, I want to say, now, when we use peace to talk about the tranquility of the status quo, I wondered if we could have that as another example of the wrong definition of peace, because you said, no, negative peace is not a good definition. So yeah. if we say, we want the calm and tranquility of the status quo, is that peace? No, that's the current violent system. So sometimes when you wow. challenge that, right, it, it, someone may characterize you as the violent one, but wow. you're really aiming at peace as you defined it, which is flourishing yeah. and freedom of movement. I was thinking of this example from South Africa, right at the time that Gandhi was doing his or organization organizing his 1913 satyagraha over the the indentured servants three pound tax at the same time you had in bloemfontein and other places of orange free state you had the women black and colored women of south africa who were protesting the pass laws and it very much connects to what you were saying about movement they're like unless you buy this pass book and unless you buy your monthly stamp you can't go to this part of town but they decided to to upset things but using nonviolent tactics that they saw not only gandhi but also the suffragettes in england and other places i mean not the suffragists didn't always use 100% nonviolent, but these women in South Africa, they filled the jails with their noncompliance. They refused to carry their passes and put pressure on the whole system. And it was a tactical movement because they saw there's only so many jails. We're going to overwhelm them. They won't know what to do. Certain towns, uh, 
decided to not impose their past laws because they didn't want to have to jail people. So, so this idea of movement, nonviolent movement, sometimes it is the best, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Now, it would be a longer talk to say, does it 100% work in every situation? But there are many times there yes. are opportunities. And Gandhi used that also in South Africa and in India. I mean, and I'm just using his name as a shorthand mm -hmm. because there were thousands of people involved. It wasn't just one person. And thousands of people engaged in this decision to upset the status quo. Yes. Maybe police are going to hit them. Maybe they're going to end up in jail. But they're putting pressure on that old system it has to collapse it has to make way for a new one yes yes and to your point at really quickly i was in vienna uh, a couple of years back and it, for the isops uh the uh, uh, international society for african philosophy oh, yeah. and studies i was there and um and and a lot of uh, um members who were nigerian and um um I, I, there was one other country they couldn't get passports or, oh. or visas to come into to uh, Austria, right? Mm. And, and I remember what they what they said during that conference. They said they're trying to stop the flow of African ideas, and that just that stuck with me, right? Because th it stopped that freedom, right? That free that free flow of of ideas, right? And, and we've we've experienced some of that even during during COVID. We've we've done it through Zoom and things of this nature, but what about thinkers who are outside of places where they can get good internet? things of that nature, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I've just got one question for Dr. Presby that's been sent in. Um, and it says, how, our, how can our schools um, manage to teach that World War I is the result of imperialist endeavors while evading discussing capitalism and the agency of folk outside Europe? Okay, let me see if I can see that chat myself. Is it, or you just got it yourself, so I can't see it on the chat. I can, I can paste it into the main chat. Um, give me a moment. Ah. Well, I question of how to teach about World War One. Now, it was Du Bois who argued in the world in Africa that underlying what were usually stated as the real reasons for the war was a bigger underlying economic and political reason, which was the scramble for Africa and the colonies. Now, we, we don't have to be reductive and say that was the only thing, but I also want to say, well, those colonies were connected in a worldwide capitalism Although it wasn't even, I mean, I've seen studies, you know, Basil Davidson and others, they go, you know, colonization wasn't even capitalism because it sure wasn't a free market. It was a mixture of uh, European uh, powers uh, using their political might to get the cheap resources they wanted and to to damp down any possibility of African capitalism or businesses flourishing or competing with them. And so you see that in Ghana, the history of Ghana is there were a lot of businesses there and there were a lot of entrepreneurs there, but when the British got there, they made all these rules disadvantaging African owned businesses. And you can see the same thing in Kenya. So I don't want to say that the British were spreading capitalism. They were spreading their controlled capitalism where they get to sell things on a market, but others are forced to sell to them at a low rate, like the cocoa example from Ghana, which is politics meddling in economics for even more profits for just a few. Now, that's an ongoing experience that's not 
only having to do with World War One. Um, World War One. So I don't exactly know what what the questioner has in mind. Were they say? I don't know if they thought I was saying capitalism had no role. No, a, a kind of distorted capitalism did have a role, but capitalism with colonialism together is not the same as laissez-faire capitalism, et cetera. But they're all problematic because of course, and as Nkrumah tried and other leaders of Africa tried, it's best to use a state economy for the benefit of all persons and Nkrumah could do that while prices for gold and cocoa were good. And then sometimes the international market changes and suddenly your commodity goes down and you suddenly don't have the money uh, for your uh, development, education, and health projects like you would like. This is part of the problem Nkrumah had after uh, gaining office. Uh, there definitely has to be both um, political and economic uh, revolution of the status quo right now, because it is definitely uh, causing suffering. Uh, at the very least, we need a fair trade movements at, at the very least. Thank you, Dr. Presby. Um, I'm just gonna invite the person if they would like to follow that up um, by unmuting or in the chat. Um, or they can send a message to me again, I can put it if they're feeling a bit shy. Yeah, I, I don't mind. Um, I think it, it, it also the question related a bit to what you and um, Dr. Neil were just talking about at the end of the last question about um, when someone calls something violent versus peaceful. So it's kind of perhaps a question of how can someone, how can we be taught something, not just World War One, but other, that was just an instance that came up in the talk um, where we can talk about one thing in such a way that we don't even engage with all these other potentially violent forces, yet they can be re-examined at another time. And how do we actually, and you were touching on some very practical ways right now about how to do that, but how, what role can philosophy, I guess philosophy talk, play in bringing like these like conceptual contradictions that we hold in our public consciousness to light, but also Dr. Neil spoke about how people have to be willing to bear, um, like that's a choice perhaps, knowing that someone will label you one way and you'll be spoken of in a way that you're not intending or treated, you know, beyond speech as well in those ways. So just how do we deal with those things is my question really. Thank you. I mean, I think Dr. Neil really helps us by defining peace as this common good and flourishing and education fits right into that. If you're limiting people's education, either by law saying, we say you cannot be, it's against the law to educate you, or just by not providing education, that is a violence because it's the, the the flourishing of individuals can't happen, you know. So I think Johan Galtung and others talked about using the word violence to realize these other kinds of systemic violences that aren't necessarily interpersonal violence with a weapon, but result in the inability to flourish. And so we have to address those issues by um, making. Uh, education more available and also decolonizing it so that it's not just education so that people can get jobs in capitalism, but education so that we can have a better idea of what the common good and flourishing are and pursue that based on our better ideas. And, and to add to that, um, as, as a student, I mean, in certain spaces, you're going to be educated in a particular way and, and given certain texts to read. And um, so in the moment of trying to, to, to alter that, um, if, if that student decides, well, at least educationally, I'm gonna be a revolutionary. Well, that's just gonna require that you're gonna have two sets of uh, books that you're gonna have to read, right? It's the books that you're get, being given by um, the syllabus of your instructors, but the books that you also seek out of other, of other, because I don't know that I've had a class 
um, maybe one where we read Nkrumah, right? Anything that Nkrumah said, right? And 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 so I, you have to think in those terms, right? Um, I, I think the last time I had a class on Gandhi was at Morehouse, right? Gandhi and King, and none in, in graduate school. Right, so you have to decide, okay, well, if I want to do these kinds of things, who were the revolutionary minded people who were writing? I'm gonna read those also. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Thank you so much as well um, for your questions out there. Dr. Hello. Neil. Hello, Cameron. Hi, um, I had a question. Um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but I'll try my best. Okay, so in history, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So in one of my history classes, we learned about like the bloodless revolution and how it was a revolution that was achieved without violence. But later I learned that it's only a bloodless revolution in perspective of the British historians. If you were Scottish or Irish, then it wasn't a bloodless revolution. And that was for the deposition of uh, King James II. I'm not good with the numerals. But my question is, if there's really no such type of revolution in a revolution to overthrow um, an oppressive government without violence, what does that mean for Black people in the United States? So, so it, it doesn't mean that black people in the United States have to be violent. It just means that there is no such thing that I would think of as the bad definition of peace, that type of a peaceful revolution, right? Because, uh, and I, I, I kind of hold on to, uh, there's, a, there's a political theorist by the name of Theta Skokpole. And, and I kind of hold on to Theta, uh, Dr. Sk uh, Skokpole's uh, definition of revolution. So revolution means a, a complete change of, of moral, I mean, of, of the moral uh, grounding of uh, myths and the governmental structure. And the same group that was in control and or class cannot be in control after the revolution. So those things are gonna upset a lot of people, right? <laughs> in that sense, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about flipping, you, you, you're not just talking about turning, knocking over the apple cart. Right, it's <laughs> turning it upside down. So, in, in that sense, uh, what does it what does it mean? Um, first of all, remember uh, I, one of the things that I, I'm really um, uh, staunch about is that revolution has to have some vision on what the goal is. Right, it it it, it, it cannot be so, so. Rebellion doesn't require that. Right, but revolution requires that there is some idea, right? It, it doesn't have to be spelled out point by point, but there has to be some idea of what the goal is, right? And so once the goal, once that takes place, you know, the young lady asked before about where philosophy's goal, uh, role in that. Once that that is spelled out, then that person has to start thinking through, well, what kinds of things would I have to do to to reach that goal, right? So I'll give you a good example, right? So, so you may say, well, I'm against uh, child labor. And I think I spoke, Cameron is one of my students. So I think I spoke about this in class, right? So um, we talk about um, child labor in, in South African mines for lithium. Well, you may say, well, <clears throat> um, I am not going to use a cell phone or things of that nature. Now that may, that may be cumbersome and <laughs> that may be very difficult, but you may have to start saying, well, how complicit am I in the oppression of myself and others, right? Because many times, one of the things Huey Newton talked about in the 70s, is he never realized how, how complicit black people were in their own oppression. And, and so that, I think that that's one of the first things you have to start thinking about. How complicit am I in my own oppression? Hopefully that answers that. <laughs> it and if I could add to that, I mean, there have been cases of nonviolent revolution. I mean, it's hard to say 100% nobody was ever harmed, but there are those that were very broadly nonviolent and succeeded, and people look to India as an example. Now, I know there were some terrorists in India. There were people who dropped bombs and assassinated, but the large part of the movement was nonviolent. 
and millions of people engaged nonviolently. And then I gave the example of Ghana. So part of the reason I chose Ghana as my example is because I knew you were talking about revolutions. And I thought, this is an easy example of nonviolent revolution. But if you look at uh, Tanganyika, which got its independence, became Tanzania, that was also nonviolent, and Kenneth Conda down in Zambia. Now, in all three of these cases, and I once wrote an article about this, in all three of these cases, once the person came to power, they then used the state apparatus to subdue their internal opponents. And I have a, a whole theory about why that happened. But the point is on their way there, on their way struggling against the British, they found a way to do it nonviolently. So it, it, can, it can be done. Yes. And remember, Nkrumah said, we felt like we had to try. Let's try nonviolence first before we say it can't be done. And yes. there are others who say, and then it becomes a debate because in other contexts, they'll say, we tried it, it didn't work. And then there's the ones who say, no, you have to just keep trying a little bit longer. And the others go, no, we tried it, it didn't work. Now it's time to take up arms. So there's there's debates throughout history. Could, it, could things have been more successful or not? And I know there are difficulties with finding it working at all times, but many times it does because it is addressing people's ideas. It's addressing their allegiances. And it's saying, you withdraw your cooperation. That very powerful government cannot keep going. Now, this gets complicated when the unpopular at home government calls on its, its uh, arms supplier abroad and then drops tons of, of munitions on people. I'm not saying it's easy, but there are some power dynamics at work in nonviolent action that have been the reasons why it has worked in many cases up to now. Thank you both for answering those questions. Um, I'll just, if there's any more, if anyone else wants to unmute or put anything in the chat, I can speak. But, now, um, but if not, I just want to say thank you for helping us navigate these big topics and for putting the time and effort to do this. Um, I found that really insightful um, and very interesting, and I'm sure others did too. Um, so, just thank you so much and thank you for everyone who have come as well i hope everyone has um, a nice weekend and um, uh, zoom fatigue isn't too bad at the moment <laughs> but we can we can um wrap up there i don't know if i got anything but well, just thank you again thank you so much all of you yes Yes, thank you for putting this putting this on, and be sure, I guess, to uh, put us in contact with the link of the recording if it's going to be available. We will. Yeah. Just for anyone who doesn't know, we'll be putting it on the Oxford Public Philosophy YouTube channel, and we can circulate that around in the event with those speakers. Leaving. <laughs> yes, I think yeah. they are. And your recording is still on?